The spike in COVID-19 infections is concerning city and state officials as vaccinations ramp up and the president unveils trillions in spending. We talk about all that and more in our Spotlight Politics tonight. And we're joined, as always, by Amanda Vinicky and Heather Sharon. First up, President Biden unveiled the infrastructure plan today, hoping it will be bipartisan. Take a look. There's no reason why it can't be bipartisan again. The divisions of the moment shouldn't stop us from doing the right thing for the future. I'm going to bring Republicans into the Oval Office, listen to them, what they have to say, and be open to other ideas. So, Heather Sharon, it's two and a quarter trillion dollar plan over about eight years, about a trillion dollars in new taxes by hiking the corporate rate from 21% to 28%. Will it have bipartisan support as the president is hoping? Well, we heard from Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell that he is not inclined to support such a broad uh, package. I also think we're going to also see some pushback on what Biden says constitutes infrastructure. Republicans are saying that it includes a whole bunch of things besides roads and bridges and uh, new bus lines and, and things like that. So this is really going to be a test of Biden's ability to get things through through not just the House, but also the Senate. And he said that the stakes are incredibly high. He said it will this the, the fate of this package will determine really whether democracy can provide what people need. So uh, no small task he's laid for himself. No small task to fix the bridges and roads in Illinois, Amanda. And we talked a little bit about it this week. The Eisenhower has problems with traffic. There's so many bridges and viaducts that are crumbling. So what's in this bill for Illinois? I mean, there will be a ton in this for Illinois if, again, this $2 trillion package does come through. And it's not just, as Heather just was noting, the classic, what you would think of as infrastructure. I mean, this is also dealing with Chicago, of course, has an absurd amount of pipes that have lead in them. This would address that. It would address clean energy, AI, manufacturing, um, electric vehicles. So it would be more than just putting money into roads as they are now, it would be a transformation of roads in transportation, rail as well. And Chicago, of course, one of the reasons that the city grew so much is because it is a hub for transit. And so I, this really would mean a lot to Illinois. And by the way, not just to the physical structures, but also the workers. And because part of this, the president has included also a big boost for unions. And of course, this is a very much a labor state and city. A lot of trade unions, the Road Builders Association waiting with bated breath here. Let's move on to the COVID spike. Mayor Lightfoot sounded the alarm over that COVID spike at a firehouse news conference today. Take a look. We um, have over 400, almost 500 cases on average as of today. That's a quantum leap from where we were even three weeks ago. That is concerning, and that is obviously dictating that we have to proceed with caution as we open up. We're not going to see anything more significant in the reopening front until we see those numbers stabilize and start to come down. So there we had Dr. Arwady earlier in the show. Are these numbers risking a full reopen in the summer? Absolutely. Uh, it is a race against time between cases of COVID, which is being driven by the more transmissible variants and the vaccination effort. Uh, you know, when I spoke yesterday with Dr. Emily Landon of U of C Medicine, she said, look, uh, the vaccine is the tortoise. It's going slow. We know it's going to get across the finish line first, but these COVID variants are the hare and they are racing ahead. And this is exactly the pattern that we saw in in October, where cases started out among the 18 to 39 year olds, and then it spread to older people and eventually 25 Chicagoans were dying every day after being diagnosed with COVID-19. So it's really exactly what we saw back in the fall, which was why she said it sounded like ground, she was felt like she was experiencing Groundhog Day. Uh, and that certainly is what it feels like to cover this most recent increase in, in cases. And this Heather, happened you know, I think in that fable, the tortoise ends up winning at the end of the right. race. So let's keep our slow fingers and steady. Right. Slow and That's steady right. wins the race. So there's been a slow and steady vaccination effort, but it has amped up new vaccination sites, including at Wrigley Field, Amanda. So 
Where, where is the breaking point here where the level of vaccinations will overtake the rising cases and uh, rates can come down? Paris, if we only knew the answer to that question, that is what we keep on hearing, particularly from the city officials who say we need more vaccine. We are equipped. We've gotten now these additional mass vaccination sites. We're equipped to give it when it is enough here. Something that is sort of an interesting political squabble. You also heard Governor J.B. Pritzker today saying, hey, I, I think this city is going too slow with its eligibility rollout, really singling out the city of Chicago for not wanting to go forward with his April 12th date for making any adult eligible, which is sort of an interesting political spat because by the way, it's not just Chicago that is doing this. While the state has allowed any local health department at this point to go ahead and open up capacity to, again, anybody over the age of 16, you're seeing a lot of health departments not able to do that, particularly those that are in and around the city. And in fact, Cook County, Cook County that is, has been even slower than the city of Chicago in expanding its eligibility. So Pritzker is talking about Chicago not going faster, although Dr. Arwady earlier in the show said state officials need to allocate more vaccines for the state here because we've heard about excess supplies in places like Quincy. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a, you're right. It, it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a blame game here, Heather. Let's, let's move on to uh, Loretto Hospital. Um, the allegations and the reports were fast and furious last week and the week before. And now uh, its CEO is suspended for two weeks without pay. The COO quit, of course. And then we hear that state rep Camille Lilly, who works at Loretto Hospital, she is accused reportedly of having a VIP list. Uh, explain, Heather, where all this is at. Well, Loretto Hospital was really showcased by the mayor and the Chicago Department of Public Health as a safety net hospital that was serving people that was at greatest risk of severe illness from COVID-19, um, illness and death. And it has just turned 180 degrees because it's clear that they were vaccinating people who were not eligible and they were vaccinating people based on their connections to both the CEO and the COO. So there was no doubt that that was a real black mark um, in Lightfoot's mind. And I think it really caused a great deal of consternation among West Side residents who were struggling to find a vaccine. And they were, many people were just angry that these people were being prioritized over them, even though they were playing the, the hunger games that we've all been playing to try to get a, a vaccine. And Amanda, I've asked this before, and since you cover state government, I mean, it's it's just very intriguing that on the hospital's board, there were two state representatives, LaShawn Ford resigned, so now it's just State Senator Kimberly Lightford, and then Camille Lilly, as we mentioned, are they going to escape any kind of damage from the fallout here? I mean... Uh, thus far, it seems as if they have, from what we gather. Um, the, the CEO has not lost his position, nor has Lily for an external affairs officer. She certainly hasn't been out in front of this answering questions instead. There's a private company that has been hired to sort of do damage control here. And um, speaking on her behalf, denying that Representative Lily had any sort of special list. Um, and, and so there certainly are, I think, uh, a whole lot of questions and what this raises is, is if there is a culture of those at the top being able to do favors for their friends where else has that sprung up at Loretto there's an investigation so at this point we're going to have to see what turns up but neither of those legislators have said very much all right a couple reports today somewhat critical of the Chicago Police Department Heather you mentioned earlier the consent decree monitor coming out with its report saying the police department's doing a little bit better complying but then the inspector general talking about the gang database uh, that CPD has used tell us why um, that has become such a bugaboo for the CPD well, two years ago, Inspector General Joe Ferguson said that the way that the city tracked gang members was ripe for abuse, filled with error, and served no clear law enforcement purpose. And the city said, we agree. The police department said, yes, we're going to do better. and We're going to create a new system. Well, that was two years ago. And the police department is still using the data contained in that error-filled database, which has included people who were as young as seven and as old as 100. 
hundred years old and disproportionately uh, included black and Latino Chicagoans. So the follow-up report from, from the inspector general's office said clearly that nothing had changed in over two years, even though it had become a, a really a high profile uh, scandal, if you will. And uh, it's not clear um, whether the police department has a firm plan in place to create a new system, uh, which of course is needed, everybody agrees, but the devil's in the details as per usual. And I've interviewed a few folks that were purportedly on that list and what they told me was it's hard to find jobs, it's hard to find credit, it's hard to sort of get a life going. And what they told me was they were never part of any gang. They were erroneously put on that list. And a lot of people have uh, suggested that, that they had no business being on that list. However, CPD compiled it. Amanda, late this afternoon, we learn of another federal indictment of another former state lawmaker, this one, Anazette Collins. Who is she and what's she charged with? Anazette Collins was a legislator representing the west side of Chicago, so um, had ties and was endorsed for a long time there until he ended up leaving her Secretary of State, Jesse White. She served in the Illinois House before moving over via appointment to the Senate, and then when she tried to run for that Senate seat, she lost it. Uh, so now uh, that's Patricia Van Pelt who took that seat. And at the time, part of that campaign was that Collins had been under scrutiny, and in fact, we, we know that there had been a, a subpoena for her involvement in the now defunct General Assembly scholarship program that she'd been you know, abusing it and misawarding these scholarships to state universities. When she lost that race, she went on this revolving door in Illinois politics to become a lobbyist. And you guessed it, Paris, some of her clients, one of them, Commonwealth Edison, another one, by the way, uh, it was those sweepstakes companies and that caught up another former member of the Illinois House, Luis Arroyo. So right, what, what she was charged with has to do with not filing income taxes properly for both her personal self and her lobbying business. But I think what it really says is if this is a reminder to all of us from the feds, hey, we still have our eye on all of these shenanigans in Illinois politics and particularly this ComEd situation has not gone away. ComEd, not a surprise there. They haven't been in the news a lot. Heather Sharon, <laughs> um, we heard that the Vice President Kamala Harris is going to be coming to Chicago next week. I believe it would be the first visit by any cabinet official uh, in the Biden administration. Uh, what's that visit going to entail? Well, uh, the vice president is going to speak with Mayor Lightfoot about the city's effort to equitably roll out vaccines and to ensure that black and Latino Chicagoans basically are first in line for those vaccines because we have seen that those communities suffer greatly during the pandemic. Uh, you're right. It's a high profile visit uh, and it is no, uh, you know, uh, it's not a surprise that it would be to Chicago and it would be showcasing Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who, of course, endorsed Biden during the primary and was a surrogate for Biden during the general election campaign and who has said that she was just thrilled to see an African-American and Asian-American become vice president of, of the United States. So this is clearly signaling that Chicago's close ties to the White House, uh, which were on a four year hiatus, are, are back in full effect. We'll see if there's a direct line there to the White House. Okay, Heather Sharon, Amanda Vinicky, thank you so much for joining us as always. Thank you.